When I was 29 years old, I was serving as a Baptist youth minister in Texas, and I came out as a gay man. Yeah, it was an adventure. <laughs> there was one particularly hot July day when I was mowing my lawn and thinking about how difficult my life had been and how depressed I had been, and I thought, you know, if things are going to be bad, which I had every reason to expect they might, I just wanted to get it all over with at once. So that week, I was going to come out to my boss, who was a 70-year-old Baptist minister, and to my mother. So that day, during worship planning meeting, at a pause in the conversation, completely out of nowhere, I said, Ray, I'm gay. <laughs> and then a couple of days later, I drove to my parents' house, where I came out to my mother and to my stepfather, whom she had married only two months before. Well, the boss didn't fire me and my mother and stepdad embraced me with love. So my story is not as difficult or traumatic as that of other LGBTQ persons in similar circumstances. But I did spend the next few years trying to hold together with authenticity and integrity the various aspects of my identity, my faith, my family, my uh, sexuality, my home, and some of the most conservative places in the United States. And there were the exciting moments. There was the time I was on a political debate show with some anti-gay politicians who were insulting me to my face and I had to keep my cool. Or the time I was protested by Westboro Baptist Church. Or the time in 2009 when the Oklahoma State Republican Party platform objected to a prayer I had given. You can look it up, it's on page 29. <laughs> so what do you do with all of that? You write a book about it. So I spent much of the next uh, decade trying to write the experiences of my past of coming out as a gay man. And pretty quickly, you realize that memoir writing is a spiritual exercise. You have a few epiphanies in the process of writing about your past. For example, one came when I wrote about the very first sermon I had given when I was 14 years old at the First Baptist Church of Miami, Oklahoma. I hadn't thought about that sermon for a long time, so I had to go back and pull out my sermon notes, which I still had, and, and then watch the old VHS tape. I was really glad those 80s fashions had not lasted. <laughs> and my Oklahoma accent, fortunately, is not as strong as it once was. That sermon was on a passage from the book of the prophet Isaiah that includes the line, any tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment thou shalt condemn. The theme of that sermon was how we are persecuted because we are different, and yet we can hope in the protection of God. Well, writing about that experience 25 years later, I realized something for the first time, which is that is exactly the sermon that a gay teenager is going to preach. A gay kid who feels different, persecuted, judged, that sermon was really an expression of hope that my life would be vindicated. But writing about your past, not every moment you write about do you realize such a narrative triumph. Writing about your past, you are compelled to write about some of the most difficult moments of your life when you were depressed, afraid, angry, selfish, bereaved, and then describe them in detail for complete strangers to read. So, but writing about my past, I figured out was therapeutic. I was compelled to consider my motion, my decisions and actions and both good and bad and to take account of them. I was compelled to consider my emotions at some of the most difficult moments in my life and come to terms with them. I was compelled to think about the choices I had made and the actions I had taken and the effects that they had had on other people. And ultimately, I experienced that as freeing. I had opened my past for self-examination, so now I was opening myself to the whole world. The day the book came out, I was of kind of two minds. One was really excited to have completed this like life goal, and the other really incredibly anxious about how vulnerable I had just made myself. Well, one of the current trends in biblical studies and theology is to explore those disciplines through the lens of trauma. And when you do that, you pretty quickly realize that trauma has deeply influenced the writing and development of the Hebrew and Christian scriptural traditions and has shaped our theology. You can also identify that the tradition has tools for resilience. 
One example, Serene Jones, a theologian, talks about the importance of storytelling, that traumatized people need to be able to tell their stories, and then they need their stories to be witnessed by compassionate listeners so that together they can mourn the past and begin to imagine a different future. All of our spiritual traditions contain specific practices for compassion, forgiveness, hospitality, generosity, neighborliness, and these are tools for resilience. But on an even deeper level, all of our spiritual and wisdom traditions remind us that life is vulnerable. We live in a violent world. Natural disasters or human-made catastrophes can rob us of our well-being. We can do some bad things. We can fall into vices. But on an even more deeper level, the very nature of time involves perishing. The greatest moments of our lives, when we are overwhelmed with joy and love and beauty and adventure, are temporal and therefore fleeting. So change and loss are built into the very fabric of the cosmos. What do we do to these realities? How do we respond to them? Well, one human tendency is to simply ignore them and hope that they go away. And that's to live a kind of apathetic, passive sort of life, lacking in adventure. Another tendency is to try to exert so much control over every situation that we are protected from our vulnerability. But as theologian Elizabeth Gandolfo writes, but the result of not being vulnerable to pain is to close oneself off to beauty. There is another way. That other way we call the peaceful soul. The peaceful soul embraces the vulnerab our vulnerability and doesn't try to control it. The peaceful soul accepts that human life involves weakness and pain and loss and yet still enjoys life because they also recognize that we are surrounded by love and beauty and joy. The peaceful soul has overcome the narrow confines of the self and is attentive to all others. The peaceful soul experiences our world with wonder and gratitude. So when I was 29 years old, I opened the closet door and came out in strange and interesting circumstances. And then I spent the next years of my life opening my past for self-examination and reflection, and then ultimately made myself vulnerable to the wider world. My spiritual tradition teaches that my resilience will not be achieved by ignoring the realities of my life, nor will it be achieved by trying to control every aspect of it, that my peace will come when I live more openly. So I've tried to do that. Have I arrived at a peace that passes all understanding? Not yet. But I am trying to live more openly. And I'm enjoying it. Thank you. <laughs>